The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. I have always wanted to be a mother. 14 years. Why would you give me this deep desire and then not deliver on it? With nothing to show for it, but tears. Sometimes it's easier to give up and that's what we almost did. Watch as a promise is finally fulfilled. You've got to be kidding me. Our week of prayer continues. There wasn't a dry eye in that OR. On today's 700 Club. Welcome folks to this edition of the 700 Club. The Attorney General Bill Barr says, no way am I going to sit before a group of staff members, attorneys, questioning me. I don't have to and I'm not going to. So if that sets up a confrontation, so be it. But I get sick in my stomach when I hear these guys on the Democratic Party saying, well, the American people want to know. The American people couldn't care less about all these details. If you watch those hearings, they are extremely boring. They're, they're about as much fun as a leg cramp. And it's the same stuff over and over again, trying to trip this brilliant man. They're not going to succeed. And then they say, well, he ought to resign. No way. He's doing a great job, and we want to uh, support him. Amber Strong has more on the story. Attorney General William Barr pulled the plug on Thursday's testimony before the House Judiciary Committee. He is terrified of having to face a uh, skilled attorney. But the Justice Department says that's not the case, and the department objects to the House Democrats' insistence that Barr take questions from congressional lawyers, not just from Congress. Do you solemnly swear that Barr's refusal to appear before the House committee comes just one day after contentious back and forth with Senate Democrats. Even if it's not a crime, do you think it's okay for the president to ask his White House counsel to lie? Much of the debate centering around a letter from special counsel Robert Mueller to the attorney general criticizing aspects of Barr's summary of Mueller's principal conclusions in his Russia investigation. In it, Mueller writes the summary letter the department sent to Congress and released to the public did not fully capture the context, nature, and substance of this office's work and conclusions. He said that his concern focused on his explanation of why he did not reach a conclusion on obstruction. And he wanted more put out on that issue. The letter's a bit snitty, and I think it was probably written by one of his staff people. But Barr says Mueller made it clear to him he did not think the letter misled the American people about the Russia report. He went on to criticize the fact that the special counsel did not make a decision when it came to obstruction of justice. If he felt that he shouldn't go down the path of making a traditional uh, prosecutive decision, then he shouldn't have investigated. Committee Chairman Lindsey Graham using the so hearing to question the origins this, of the Russia investigation. We know that the person in charge of investigating hated Trump's guts. These are the people that made a decision that Clinton didn't do anything wrong and a counterintelligence investigation of the Trump campaign was warranted. And when it comes to collusion, obstruction, and a future testimony from Robert Mueller, no more hearings in the Senate Judiciary Committee. I'm not going to do any more. Enough already. It's over. But it may not be over for Barr. Several Democrats, including many presidential candidates, are calling for him to step down. Should Barr resign? I think he's lost the confidence of the American people. I think he should. The House Judiciary says they will hold Thursday's hearing with or without Barr. And the battle for the release of the full Mueller report could lead to a vote to hold the Attorney General in contempt. Amber Strong, CBN News, Washington. You know, people have, have written me, not, not a lot, but a couple of people have asked, uh, why do you favor uh, intervening in Venezuela? Let me tell you what the consequences are. The Russians right now are running the military in Venezuela. They are in control of Maduro's people. Uh, if that state falls and becomes a, a haven, then the Russians will have a base and they could be flying long-range bombers all over the United States and North American continent with, with impunity. The second thing that is there, uh, the Chinese hackers would just love to have a base uh, protected by a country to uh, undermine the democracies in, in South America. We're looking about an entire continent that's right below us being turned into a communist paradise, so to speak. 
and we don't want it to happen. We have a very important issue in it. And ladies and gentlemen, I tell you, and we, we've got to do it. We cannot allow this Maduro to stay in power and to continue to oppress the Venezuelan people. But if that isn't enough, if oppression of a people isn't enough, then we have vital interests of not having a communist base, a Russian base to our south. And right now, there's such a thing as the Monroe Doctrine, where President Monroe said we will not permit the intervention of foreign powers in the Western Hemisphere. Well, they're there. The Russians are there. The Chinese are there. And undoubtedly, uh, the Iranians and others of our enemies are there. And we cannot allow that state to fall. It's just that simple. And it's time that the United States back up Guado and his call for democracy. And, you know, they want to have elections. They want to have freedom. They want to have all the things that we consider important. But it's very, very important. And people in Venezuela are still rising up against their socialist leader. But the question is, will they get help? John Jessup has that. Well, Pat, tensions are rising in uh, Venezuela. Venezuelans pouring into the streets this week after opposition leader Juan Guaido called them to a widespread military uprising. But dictator Nicolas Maduro's military did not heed the call and instead dispersed the crowds with tear gas. Maduro is accusing protesters of, quote, serious crimes that would not go unpunished. Guaido said that ousting Maduro was just around the corner. As the standoff drags on, life is becoming even more difficult for Venezuelans who are already struggling with hyperinflation. Well, here in the U.S., the central part of the country is recovering from an outbreak of severe storms, which brought hail and flooding with more than 30 tornado t uh, tornadoes touching down across five states. The storm stretched from Texas and Oklahoma into Missouri, where homes were heavily damaged in the town of Ozark by a possible tornado. The system kept hitting into the heartland into Wednesday and brought flooding into Iowa as well. In all eight states were under flood alerts. Well, the 145th Kentucky Derby takes place this weekend, but the state's attorney general is warning that the legendary horse race draws more than just sports fans. It also attracts human traffickers. The grim fact is that large sporting events like the Derby draw not only racing enthusiasts and revelers, but also individuals who have enslaved children and adults and exploit them for sex and labor. Victims are also the mo often the most marginalized in our society, victims of abuse and violence, runaways, refugees, and immigrants. They are the lost, the lonely, and the left behind. But that's exactly who my faith tells me that we are supposed to serve. The attorney general says Kentucky is partnering with Catholic charities to train 9,000 people on how to spot and report trafficking during the Derby. And, Pat, this is something that you've been speaking out against for years. I really have. But, you know, that Derby is something else. Have uh, you been? I, yeah, I guess I was there there one time. Uh, you know, uh, Churchill Downs, the, the old building, I don't think they've, it, it was a fire trap. It was wooden, and you, know, you wondered how soon it was going to catch fire, and you'd be burned to death. <laughs> Uh, but it was funny. I was the, the, I, I brought with me one of the former governor, and uh, we had a table, and uh, it, it cost us I think twenty three hundred bucks a seat to sit at the table. We were we were at the finish line of the derby. Oh, at the finish line. All right. So my wife is there, and uh, they had a preliminary race, and I said, Well, which horse do you like? We said I like number seven or whatever it was. So they run this race, and boom, and they go around the track. And this horse wins. And I said, Dee Dee, how did you know that horse was going to win? She said, I liked its tail. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the way to pick them. That's, that's how a so lot of women that, pick so impressed yeah. the other people sitting at their table. A couple of them were Catholics. They said, you give us the winner and we'll convert. <laughs> 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 said, you know, that didn't exactly. So that was the year the Swale won. And he's a little horse and he, he won. But I tell you, it's over in, in, in two minutes. And it's, you know, all those that all that they look so cheap and gaudy all those hats oh, and, the hats no oh. the hats are fantastic and, well no. if you're there it's not as fantastic as you, you think. probably can't see anything because yeah, of all the hats all, it's all my yeah. old kentucky home and all the mint juleps and all that it's all it's all just hype i mean they do a good job of hyping but it's one more horse race and it's over in two minutes yeah but the the, the you have some great horses and i i'm a horse lover and i 
I, I, I enjoy it, but I, I just want you to know this last horse that won the, won the Triple Crown, that was a miracle. When you, he won yeah. the Belmont, which is a long, hard race, he won the Preakness, which was a relatively short race, and he won the Kentucky Derby. I mm -hmm. mean, that was. I mean, the, and the jockey, he's a believer. A believer, he Smith, yeah, he's, he's a great guy. So, but anyhow, there are a lot of Christians down there, and it's, it's a, yeah, but man, what you see on television is so beautiful, with all the roses and all the mint juleps and all my, <laughs> and then you get there and you say, come on, <clears throat> massive crowds, massive uh, uh, shutdown of traffic. I mean, you know. Watch it on TV, right? Watch it on TV and enjoy it and make believe you're there. Okay, John. As Didi said, pick him by the horse's tail. Well, today is the National Day of Prayer, and people are coming together all over the country to pray, even on Capitol Hill. Abigail Robertson brings us this look at how lawmakers are celebrating the special day. Each year during the week of the National Day of Prayer, this group sets up in front of the Capitol, rain or shine, for a 90-hour Bible reading marathon. Around 400 people from around the world are taking part this year, including a few lawmakers. Let the Lord himself require. Keith Davidson, who's leading this year's event, tells CBN News volunteers read throughout the night. We had a lady last night who was on standby from Alabama that flew in just to read, and she left back out this morning at 6 a.m. This annual tradition dates back to 1990. As you can see, they have tons of different versions and translations of the Bible here. Can you tell us some of the most unique you have? Yes, Abigail, if you look here, we have a Farsi Bible, and folks can come by and read that in their language. We also have a Russian Bible, and we have a Chinese Bible that a group yesterday, a Chinese church actually here in Washington, D.C., brought out. And concludes on the National Day of Prayer with a reading from Revelation. God, we lift up your name, we lift up your word, and the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This year's theme is love one another. It's an appropriate theme, especially for this time. Congressman Johnson is spearheading efforts towards unity in Congress. It's a bipartisan effort to just get members to talk to each other and, and basically follow the golden rule, to treat one another with dignity and respect as fellow Americans and part of the American family. Lawmakers and faith leaders like Dr. Ronnie Floyd and Pastor Andrew Brunson will join together inside the nation's capital Thursday night to pray. It's one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had to be able to come right in Statuary Hall, right in the centerpiece, the epicenter of American government, and to be able to pray and sing and worship and have this kind of service that we will have. To see if there's an event happening in your area today, visit nationaldayofprayer.org. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Thanks, Abigail. And you can find links about those locations for the National Day of Prayer events around the country at CBNNews.com. Pat, back to you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we've got some interesting things coming up. And Wendy, tell us about it. We sure do. Up next, the queen of clean comedy takes on a serious subject. I am not ashamed to stand up for the cause of Christ to tell you that I believe he is who he says he was, and I will never be ashamed. John DePierce talks to our Ephraim Graham about her new film called Unashamed when we come back. Well, it's a great day to be alive. This is the day the Lord hath made, and we rejoice and are glad in it. America's favorite clean comedian is taking her show to the box office with a new docu documentary. It's called Chanda Pierce Unashamed. And this time she's telling jokes and turning the spotlight on people who are taking bold stands for their Christian faith. Chanda tells our Ephraim Graham how her own life led to this latest project. Girls, hang on to your man. Get him a makeover or a new toothbrush or something. Just hang on to your man, because there ain't nothing out there. Shonda Pierce makes millions laugh. 
These days, it's with stories about her life after the death of her husband and high school sweetheart, David. Usually ain't got no shirt on, beer gut hanging over. Let me tell you, if a man has to wear a bra bigger than me, I ain't going out with him. So you've been a member of the Widow's Club three, uh, three years? Almost four years Almost now. four years. I could be coming up on five. Wow. 2014, my husband passed away. The second year was the hardest, I think, for me. The second year is when people forget that yeah. you were widowed. Uh, the second year is when the sympathy cards don't come, you know, at all. Um, we don't do well remembering our widows, yeah. but I'm doing good. I uh, had a couple of dates, mm -hmm. you know, enough to know, done with that. <laughs> <laughs> But, oh, never in your life is there more time to become aware of the presence of God mm. than we are, when you are completely alone. Mm. And I mean completely alone. My, husband, my son moved back to California. Mm -hmm. You know, we are a thousand miles away, which I, I think he likes it that way. <laughs> you know, I have a, a child that is not in my life, and that's still very sad. But all that to say, I, this is it. Well, because you're here, and I think Kathy Lee says, if you've got a pulse, you've got a purpose. That's so exactly you, you've right. Got stuff to and do. that's exactly right. And my heart does go out to those who forget that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I am in a room every night with several thousand women, mm -hmm. you know, and I love, love, love my job. But I also can see the looks on the faces of those who have laughed freely and are having a wonderful time, and those who was, it was an effort, they're in a dark place, or especially when you ask for the, how many widows in the room and the hands go up, you, you wanna go and hug them and go, I promise it feels like this now, but life is not over. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, a couple of years ago when the president was elected, yes. uh, I was surprised that uh, you were in the middle of <laughs> some heat. You up. think you huh? were surprised? I was really surprised. If you've ever tried to put on a pair of Spanx in an airplane bathroom. The comedian faced criticism and ugly headlines for performing at this inaugural ball. When uh, someone asked me my opinion of the, of, the, of the election, and I boldly just said, I'm going to vote for Donald Trump. <laughs> Woo! In one day, I lost 25,000 followers. And in a 24-hour period, I gained 70-something thousand, you know, <laughs> and so the odds were okay. Mm -hmm. And these are Christians that are, you know, were upset with my my jumping in there in, in the choices. But I feel, I feel very strongly about when someone asks me my opinion or my thought that I have to speak truthfully. Mm -hmm. And I speak without the worry or filtering, what's this going to do to my career? What's this going to Now, I'm sure my manager and my publicist wish I would filter that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> that unfiltered boldness is the premise of her latest film, Unashamed. Uh, this is your third documentary. This is my third documentary, and Ephraim, I'm still alive. <laughs> Why do they, it's like, I don't know what they're going to make when I'm dead. You know, it's like, oh, no, like no. they've got all, you know, and documentaries are for people that are deceased. Now, the first one, Laughing in the Dark, I thought I was almost dead. Mm -hmm. And then Enough came out that was this, you know, coming back to lifetime mm -hmm. in my life, and it ended happier, you mm -hmm. know. What I love about this movie, it has very little to do about me. <laughs> Hallelujah, you know. David and Jason Benham are identical twins. They have strong hearts for Jesus, and they are hilarious. In this movie, Shonda sits down with successful people who are unashamed of their Christian faith, even when faced with criticism. HGTV already knew everything that we believed before right. they ever hired us. Right. So it, they didn't fire us because of our beliefs per se. They fired us because of the pressure that was put on them from the thought mafia. Yeah, from the thought mafia about our beliefs. It is so funny that even in this day and age, I've been at this for 26 years, and I cannot tell you how often I still get pushback of, now you're a comedian and a Christian? You know, why is that such a baffle? And what I worry about is when you find out your favorite actor or comedian or somebody, oh, I didn't know they were a Christian. I want to go, now why didn't you know that? <laughs> you know, because yeah. I want the love of Jesus to be on my life so much that it doesn't surprise people. Yeah. And I think as the world goes on, and I'm no you know, theologian, I'm no Pat Robertson, <laughs> okay. but I read everything you write, you know. But I think as time goes on, it's gonna get harder before it gets easier mm. to stand up for Christ. It's gonna be a time of, of great pushback. Mm. We are at a place where the church can no longer be lukewarm. I am not ashamed to stand up for the cause of Christ. 
to tell you that I believe he is who he says he was. And I will never be ashamed. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Nashville, Tennessee. Well, how about it? Isn't she something? Chanda Pierce, unashamed, is in theaters for two nights only, May 7th and May the 9th. You can look for one near you on CBNNews.com. Wendy. She is truly funny. How I was laughing out loud Didn't just she in something? some of those clips well, one, yeah. about the Spanx. <laughs> well, coming up, a couple faces the moment of truth when a technician reveals the results of their baby's ultrasound. She literally gets tears in her eyes. And I'm thinking, of course, oh no, <laughs> oh no, you know, it's not good. Well, I thought this was, you know, this is it, you know, this is the end of this journey. But it was only the beginning. Stay tuned for the story of a miracle baby, 14 years in the making, when we come back. Well, we are in day four of our annual week of prayer. Every day at noon, our CBN staff has been joining with Regent University to pray for the, requ the requests that you have mailed into us. Yesterday, pastor and author Ben Corson was our featured speaker. Here are some highlights from the service. And the Bible says Jesus Christ is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Emmanuel, Messiah, the Prince of Peace, the Son of God, the Captain of our salvation, the image of the invisible God, and the anchor of hope. Paul the Apostle writes this. Now may the God of hope, everyone say, God of hope. Fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope. Everyone say, abound in hope. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. How you perceive God dictates how you receive from God. So if you perceive God as the God of hope, you will receive from him the ability to abound in hope. He wants to empower, ennoble, enable, and equip you to lead a life filled with hope. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or even think, according to the power that is at work within us, God cannot lie, and all the promises of God in him are yes and amen. We loved having Ben on the show, and boy, he can preach. Well, we invite you to join uh, today's chapel service. It streams live at noon Eastern. Today's guest speaker will be author Lisa Robertson, who's also joining us later on today's show. And if you haven't sent us your prayer requests yet, just give us a call. The number toll-free on your screen, 1-800-700-7000, or you can go to CBN.com. Well, now we have an amazing story for you. Um, but before we get to your prayer request, we want you to meet Logan and David Minat. Minot. For 14 years, the couple hoped and prayed for a baby. During those years, their in vitro fertilization ended in a miscarriage and two attempts to adopt a child failed. Logan and David were about to lose all hope and that's when they received their miracle. I have always wanted to be a mother. It consumed my every thought. It consumed our lives um, trying to start our family. When Logan Minot and her husband Dave married in 2004, both hoped kids would be a big part of their lives. But after two years of trying without getting pregnant, Logan sought medical advice. I had been diagnosed with PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. It's very stressful. I felt like it was a big delay in us sort of starting our family. OBGYN Dr. Francis Escara explains. What we have is we have a problem with, with ovulating, but more importantly, we have a lot of large cysts in the, in the ovaries. It's one of the main causes of infertility. But it wasn't just Logan. We found out that Dave also had sort of a component to male infertility as well. It was kind of kind of tough to swallow. I was angry, angry at the situation, frustrated. If I had to put a, a number on it, I would probably say less than 15% chance of getting pregnant on their own naturally. Right away, Logan started fertility treatments, but the months turned into years with no success. Pretty tough, to be honest with you, not to be able to get pregnant and stuff, and to see Logan go through it, it's even, it was even worse. We would pray that the Lord would just show us what our next step was to be. Finally, in 2009, there was a glimmer of hope 
Through in vitro fertilization, Logan became pregnant with twins. I can remember just praying to the Lord, please, just begging Him, rocking back and forth in my bed, praying to the Lord that, that this would be the one, and, and then it wasn't. After just one week, Logan miscarried. I can remember being so disappointed and upset with God, like, why me? You know, questioning his plan. I just wanted to <laughs> throw in the towel and, and give up because it was tough. Why would you give me this deep desire and this passion to be a mother and Dave to be a father and then not deliver on it? But then I would hear the Lord say, no, no, no. I gave you that desire. It's going to happen. They decided to turn to adoption. Our first adoption attempt, unfortunately, the baby passed away. The second adoption attempt, the mother decided to keep the baby. I get beat down so many times, and it's sometimes it's easier to give up, and that's what we almost did. I just really felt the Lord saying, do not let this situation and the enemy steal your joy. You cannot let this infertility define you. So in 2016, Logan began to focus on her health. She lost a lot of weight and stopped obsessing over her infertility. Instead, she concentrated on the blessings in her life and drew closer to God. We kind of didn't really give up on having a baby, but it wasn't consuming every minute of the day. Then in late 2017, Logan noticed some physical changes. After about 12 weeks, she decided on a whim to take a pregnancy test. It was positive, so she took another one and then another. You've got to be kidding me! It too was positive, and the amount of joy in my heart at that second was unreal. 14 years of disappointments made Logan and Dave cautious, so the next day she went for an ultrasound. During the exam, Logan shared their story with the technician. She literally gets tears in her eyes. And I'm thinking, of course, oh no, <laughs> oh no, you know, it's not good. Well, I thought this was, you know, this is it, you know, this is the end of this journey. Well, she flips the screen around and she goes, Logan and Dave, not only are you pregnant, but you are 12 weeks pregnant with a healthy little baby. And we were just instantly, <laughs> tears, you know, flowed. And it was just such a joyous moment for us. I was flabbergasted. I was like, wow, this is it. If you are gonna have a miscarriage, it's typically in that first trimester. The Lord knows what I would worry during that first trimester. And he thought, you know what, Logan, you are gonna be pregnant and I'm gonna zoom you through your first trimester so you are not to worry. On September 11, 2018, Logan gave birth to a healthy baby girl, Harper Lynn. I was nervous, but as soon as that doctor put her in my arms, just all the nerves went away, so pretty neat. My heart was just so full. I was so thankful to the Lord for finally delivering on that promise and for giving Harper to us. When I delivered Harper, that's one of the great honors of my life. There wasn't a dry eye in that OR. I thought about how not every child will be loved as much as this child. I love being a dad. It's, it's neat to come home, especially, you know, she's getting to that age where she smiles and she knows who's coming in the door. With the infertility issues that Logan and, and Dave had faced together, I would definitely call Harper a miracle baby. Sometimes things don't happen overnight and things take time. That's because the Lord's putting together the plan, the perfect plan for you. So keep praying and Someday you'll have a beautiful masterpiece that the Lord has prepared especially for you. That's exactly right. Keep praying God is putting your plan together and it doesn't have to look like everyone else's plan. Yeah, wasn't that beautiful though? I mean, really, uh, children are the gift of the Lord and happy is the man whose quiver is full of them. Listen, we've got some prayer requests. We've This is the week of prayer and we've been asking you to send in your prayer requests and right now we have thousands and thousands of requests that have been written in, some called in, but we want to pray for you especially today. And here's some. This one says, I've got type 1 diabetes and I need a creative miracle. You know, that, that's the kind of thing that you're born with. And it's, well, it takes a miracle. 
somebody's got congestive heart failure and needs a healing, somebody who's got a son who's an alcoholic needs deliverance, and somebody says, I want salvation. She's got a family, children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. It's a big family, and they need all to find the Lord. And I'm pleased to say that I've got 14 grandchildren, 14 great-grandchildren, and each one, as they're coming along, find Jesus, and it's wonderful. So what do you it's have? It's wonderful. Here's a big prayer request. Um, she asked that my husband and I be healed, both of us be healed of dementia. Uh, to be healed, here's a one, to be healed of cervical dystonia, involuntary muscle contractions in the neck. Mm. Never heard of that. To be healed of breast cancer for the second time in three years. We'll pray for that. Grateful none of my family was hurt in last year's hurricane, but we all lost our homes and don't have the means to replace. Wow. Lots well, let's pray. Folks, prayers. you know, the Lord says, if two of you, if two of you will agree on earth as touching anything they'll ask, it will be done for them by my Father, which is in heaven. And God somehow wants unity. And as we join together, the power of God begins to work. Now, we're going to join, and we want to pray with you. Consider you praying with us. Let's receive God for, and believe God for a miracle. Thank Father, Thank you. you are a God of miracles. You create something out of nothing. You brought the worlds forth from nothing. You spoke the word, and the worlds came into being. And all you have to do as the centurion said to Jesus, is just speak the word and my servant will be healed. Now, Lord, speak the word and through us, speak through us in the name of Jesus. Thank you. God. Right now, cervical cancer is being healed in the name of Jesus. And somebody had that cerv cervical uh, vertebra that was out of line. God has just popped that into place. Your vertebra is going to be absolutely whole. Any bone spurs are going to melt in the name of Jesus. Amen. Many people being healed of arthritis right now, brittle bones being healed. God is breathing on your bones right now. Just receive it. Thank you, Lord. There's a neck muscle. There was a whiplash injury, and your car was hit, and your neck has been Muscles have been stretched, and you've got a great deal of pain. Put your hand on your neck right now, Mary, in the name of Jesus. Touch. Thank you, Lord. Lord, you're just you're releasing hope right now for miracles. So many people crying out for homes. They're crying out for all kinds of healings. God, you're giving hope right now that is going to release their miracle. Lord, we thank you for giving hope to those. There's a lady you just miscarried, and you are devastated, mm -hmm. and you saw this piece, and you're saying, Lord, please answer my prayer. God's hearing you right now. I speak peace. You know, the Bible says peace. My peace I give unto you. God's giving you peace right now. Peace of mind, peace of soul, peace of heart, peace of body. May the peace of God rest upon you in this moment on. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name. Wendy. All right. Well, if God's answered your prayers, give us a call. We want to hear from you. Well, still ahead, a Bible teacher and author and Pat's very own daughter-in-law, Lisa Robertson, shows you how to find the unique path of life that God has planned for you. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. With violence against, uh, against Jews rising around the world, today Israel is marking Holocaust Martyrs and Heroes Remembrance Day. Sirens blared, calling the nation to a halt for two minutes to honor the memory of the six million Jews murdered in the Holocaust. The memorial comes as Israeli researchers report violent attacks against Jews spiked significantly last year, with the largest reported number of Jews killed in anti-Semitic acts in decades. Well, a South Carolina man says God used him to save the life of a suicidal woman by carrying his cross literally. A.C. Burleson says Jesus changed his life so much that he's now carrying a real-life cross to spread the story of Jesus Christ. He's walking from South Carolina to the Grand Canyon, taking the opportunity to preach the gospel along the way. One woman encountered him while driving down the road. She stopped her car to let him know she was about to kill herself, but changed her mind after running into the man and his cross. 
Brolson says he's seen God perform other miracles, too. Well, you can find out more about both of these stories and always get the latest from CBN News by visiting CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more Today 700 Club right after this. I want to tell you a little personal story. About 30 years ago, I was busily engaged in building up CBN, and my oldest son was a student at the University of Virginia, and I received a letter which said, can you come and speak at Sweetbriar College to our Religious Emphasis Week? Well, Sweetbriar is in, near Lynchburg, and Lynchburg was near my hometown of Lexington, so I thought that was a nice thing to do, and so I said, okay, I'll do it. And so I told my son, who was up in Charlottesville, that he was going to go with me to Sweetbriar College to uh, meet these girls. And he, he was kind of, um, you know, uh, in his little deal up there at UVA. And I don't want to do that to those girls. They're just not really very attractive, and I don't need that. And I said, look, whether you need it or not, you're going, so pack your bags, and we'll pick you up and you're gonna drive with me over to uh, uh, Sweetbriar. So he said, okay. So we got over there and they had religious emphasis week and I spoke uh, in their chapel and then I gave an invitation and these girls came to the altar and they were kneeling at the altar to be filled with the Holy Spirit to receive the Lord. And here my son is, he got into it and he was laying hands on them and it just was something else. And when it was over, he said, I've never seen such sweet girls. I said, well, it's sweet briar. Of course they're sweet. <laughs> well, uh, he invited this young lady who had been my, my uh, hostess for this week to come uh, visit us. And uh, she came down to the house. And uh, about one in the morning, uh, I was in bed and they knocked on the door. And here, my son and this very lovely girl said, we've just decided to get married. And I said, that is just wonderful news. Well, I want to tell you that, you know, I, I, if I could have designed a daughter-in-law that would have been any better than this, I couldn't have succeeded. Uh, she has been an unbelievable wife, an unbelievable mother, and a wonderful, wonderful son and daughter-in-law. And so she has written a book about the path of life. And with so many choices in life, how do we know what's the best path? And so she's going to tell us about the very important first step. Here's my daughter-in-law. Author and Bible teacher Lisa Robertson knows that finding God's path for your life can be overwhelming. At a difficult time in her own life, Lisa co-founded an outreach called Changing Seasons, designed to encourage and support women in their everyday lives. And in her new book, The Path of Life, Lisa will help you discover God's path for your life and show you how to follow it one step at a time. Well, was you welcome to the 700 Club? My beautiful designer, the one I could have designed, couldn't have done any better. God did it. My daughter-in-law, Lisa, so glad to see you. God I'm bless. delighted to be here. And you're my designer father-in-law, too. <laughs> I couldn't have designed you any better. She used to be on the tennis team, and she was pregnant. She beat me in tennis. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never live it down. I was beat by a pregnant woman in a tennis game. But anyhow, she... <laughs> I went easy on you. <laughs> <laughs> you you, you me. Okay. Well, uh, you, you've got a, 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 well, tell us what's in this book. What have you got? <laughs> well, th the book is really important to me because it really begins uh, when I married Tim. And when we got married, one of your friends, the Ditchfields, gave us a present. And in the card, it said, congratulations, Tim and Lisa, Psalm 1611. And so I looked up the verse in the Bible because I didn't know what it said. And it said, God will make known the path of life and in his presence is fullness of joy, and at his right hand are pleasures forever. Yeah. And here I am starting a brand new path. I'm leaving my home in Colorado. I'm a bride, I'm getting married, I'm becoming a wife, I'm becoming your daughter-in-law. Yeah. And I was on a brand new path and I felt just, it just resonated with me that God had a path for my life and that he was going to show it to me. All right, well, what's the first step? The first step really is, is knowing Christ, is having a relationship with Jesus, because when you have a relationship with Jesus, He will guide you onto that path. 
And what I've, one of the things I've learned is as he guides you onto that path, he will take you places and he wants you to succeed. And so it's a wonderful relationship where I, you know, I am dependent on him to lead me and to guide me. And right. he has been so faithful to take me. What there. paths has he laid out for you? The path of life is the oh. main <laughs> <laughs> well, What else? Uh, I would say, well, I talk about in the book, um, there, one of the paths is a difficult path. And there's a verse in, in the Bible that talks about, it's in Psalm, that talks about how there's a difficult path that flows with abundance. Oh, I and I think sometimes we go through hardships and difficulties in our life. And for me, it was the death of, of my sister. But what the wonderful part of it, and it's all outlined in the book, is that through the death of my sister, my mother became a Christian, and our family became Christians, and God just unfolded for us that there was just this life, even though we had a great loss that we were grieving. Well, you've talked about the important thing about asking, seeking, and knocking. I love that, and I and I think that's um, you know that's one of the the important parts of it is you have to have that relationship where daily you can ask the Lord. And I think it's very simple. I mean, I will say, you know, show me. I think there's a verse in, yeah. in Chronicles that says, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. And yeah. I translate this as help. And I think you can ask him for, I would ask him for wisdom as I would raise my children. And then I would continue to seek him and to, by reading the Bible and by getting that kind of um, fortification from the promises of his word mm -hmm. to, to raise my family and then to continue to knock. But what I, one of the things I learned when I wrote the, wrote the book is that it says ask, and you know, ask, seek, knock. But the th those three words, A S, start with A S K, and it spells the word ask. That and I felt like God was saying to me again, S. I want you to ask S. me. <laughs> Please ask. Well, let me ask you. You you're the mother of five. You're the grandmother of ten, and you look like you're a you're a college girl. What is the secret? I know there are women here. How does this woman stay so young and, and beautiful? I just did hair and makeup with you. <laughs> <laughs> is that what it is? That's what it is. It's my makeup department that does it. No you know, way. again, I, I think a lot of it is, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is that, you know, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And, yeah. and I think the joy of walking on the path with the Lord, you know, strengthens me and gives me hope. And I would say the word that I keep hearing in my heart right now is to trust me. Trust me. Yeah. And I, and that's it. I, over and over again, I feel like the Lord is not saying, can you trust me? He's saying, will you trust mm. me? And I'm, and he's really asking me to make in a hard time to make that choice and make that decision. Yes, I trust the Lord. I will trust you. Well, I might also add, you've got a very beautiful daughter and she is one of our reporters. And She's doing a terrific job. Abigail. Abigail. We yeah. finished strong. That was our last baby. <laughs> was that the last one? That she's our, a baby? Uh-huh. That was well, our last she, one. And we she's finished. a sweetheart. They're, they're the daughters. There they are. It's a great family. And there's Abigail, the bride. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't that a wonderful wedding? I mean, it was fantastic. That was a wonderful wedding. Yeah. That was, you know, and I think that's the other thing is that we prayed for all of our children and we have, you know, kept, we, I think one of the things your son did, Tim was so adamant that we attend church every single Sunday. Mm. And I would be, I was raised in the Episcopal church. And so I was a lot more casual about church attendance and he was raised Baptist and he was not missing church. Yeah. <laughs> well. And, and I would say we, so our church, our children were in church every single Sunday. And I think that they are all walking with Christ and there's been a real fruit it, it, to that. And well, so I thank you for that. Well, I, I accept the path of life, folks, is the name of it. Well, where, where, where are these anywhere books are sold? How do you get anywhere them? books are sold? It's on ChristianBooks.com, Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble. All right. Are you impressed? <laughs> I'm totally impressed. You've done a good job. Lisa is going to be our featured speaker at noon today at Regent University Chapel. And you can uh, we, we, we stream that live at noon. So you're a sweetheart. God bless you. Thank you. And I thank the Lord for you and you're, for your family you're because wonderful. you're one of the best parts of my heart, <laughs> your family, all of you. <laughs> well, I've been blessed beyond measure. Hey, that's great. Lisa Robertson, my designer daughter-in-law, the beautiful lady. All right, Wendy, how about that? What a great interview. Well, still ahead, your questions, honest answers. Darla says, I've always believed that we will be in heaven for eternity. My friend says, well, we, we will be on the new earth. Who's right? Pat settles this argument and more coming up.
And welcome back to the 700 Club. It's time for your questions and honest answers. Darla writes, Pat, a friend and I have a debate going on about where we will spend eternity. I'm 80 years young and saved and have been filled with the Holy Spirit for 45 years. I've always believed that we'll, we will be in heaven for, for eternity. She says we will be on the new earth. When people died and came back, they went to heaven. Who's right, her or me? I want you to settle well, this. There are people who have, who have died and they come back. That's called a resuscitation. That's not resurrection. They come back in the same body. You know, they've been dead for 10 minutes or five minutes or something, and they've seen heaven and all that stuff. But the Lord is going to make us to be like angels. And that's what Jesus said, we'll be like the angels. And angels are living to praise God, and they, they have an eternal existence, and they, they, they're spiritual beings, and they, they will be inhabiting a new heaven and new earth. Now, whether, you know, God's going to remake the, the universe wherein dwelleth righteousness, it's going to be a place where there'll be no suffering, no sorrow, no death, no pain. And we will be spiritual beings. That's the deal. It's not me like a human being coming back in a better body that's still going to die. I, I will never die once I'm with the Lord. I'll live forever. Amen. Right? This uh, anonymous person says, Pat, please explain or give further guidance on exactly why we should send our military to <laughs> Venezuela and furthermore, why we should be spend sending money to people who are reaping exactly what they voted for. I'm responsible for how I vote as an American, which is why I don't vote for people who want socialist policies. As a Christian, am I missing something? Oh, you sure are. They didn't vote in uh, uh, that bunch. The, there was a military coup. Uh, the previous Chavez was involved in a military coup. They took over the military, then dominated the country, began to ask the uh, Cubans to come in. They ran the country into socialism. They didn't vote that stuff in. And uh, that Maduro is a thug. He's taken over. But you ask, I, I started the show, I'll say this again. Why should we be involved? Do you want a, a Russian air base to the south of America, just south of Miami, with bombers that could reach any place in the United States, would you want Chinese hackers to have a base that they could undermine not only America, but all over Latin America? Would you like that continent to fall under communism? You know, there was that Cuban missile crisis where the Cubans had missiles, and, you know, we, we came to the brink of war with Russia. This could clearly lead to a global conflict. We're talking about major, major damage and the United States being in the midst of a hideous war. All we'd have to do now is have a few drone strikes and, and a little bit of uh, military on the border, and we could uh, make that Maduro regime fall. So that's, I'm not talking about sending a whole bunch of American Marines into Venezuela. I'm talking about some military uh, support for the uh, Guado regime, and it's got to be done, or we're going to be in a heap of trouble. All right, next. All right, Frank says, hey, Pat, when Satan fell, he took a third of the angels with him. That's a lot of angels. Does this mean there was a lot of chaos in heaven? And if so, is it why God will create a new heaven after all is said and done because the old heaven is tarnished? Uh, you know, I don't have the answer. I mean, these angels were in the presence of God. They knew exactly who God was. But Satan was an angel of light, and he was a deceiver. And he, uh, well, there wasn't chaos in heaven, but the, these angels decided that sa Satan was the answer. And they followed him. That's why there's no uh, redemption for those angels. They, they, they ha there's no excuse, absolutely none. And they're going to be put in a pit that will be tormented, the devil and his angels. That's what hell's all about. It's not for people. Hell is for the devil and his angels. And they'll be bound and, and they'll be subject to torment forever. But we have, right in today's world, we have demonic power. And these are fallen angels that try to destroy human beings because humans are made in the image of God. And we're destined for heaven if we'll let the Lord work in our lives. Amen. I want to go there, but not yet. I, I want to go. Well, we're going to them when we die. That's where we'll be. All right. Well, today's power message is from Psalm 16. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Well, 
God bless all of you for Wendy and all of us. This is Pat Robertson. Thanks for being with us. Lord willing, we'll be back to 700 Club. will be on tomorrow. Don't miss it. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.